Architecture and music are all around us, so much so that they are often invisible. Architecture is often referred to as frozen music, and the link between them has long been recognized. In terms of form, structure, proportion, and acoustic properties. Equally important in both arts, though, is mood. How does a song make us feel? How does a building make us feel? I'm Seth Bosted, and this is Songs About Buildings and Moods. The first Church of Deliverance in Chicago's Bronzeville neighborhood was designed by Walter Bailey, Chicago's first licensed black architect, and its streamlined modern design, unusual for a house of worship, is certainly striking. But what moves me about the First Church of Deliverance is the power of their mission and the importance of music to that mission. Pastor James Bryson Jr. tells us more. The church was founded May 8, 1929. Uh, you'll know that there were some significant events that were taking place in the world at that time. Most notably for us here in Bronzeville was the beginning of the Great Migration from the South to the North. And so in that context, Reverend Cobbs saw that there were people that needed to be ministered to uh, that were experiencing significant difficulties. They were escaping the racism uh, and Jim Crow in the South only to come up here and find a different version of that same oppression. The Lord spoke to Reverend Cobbs and asked him to build a church and name it the First Church of Deliverance. He did just that. And God sent people from the South up to Bronzeville. And because the church was located in Bronzeville, they started flocking to this church. Uh, Reverend Combs had a unique mixture of his ability to uh, operate in both worlds, religious and secular. And so his attraction for many people was the fact that he was a person that saw dignity in every human being, right? Uh, uh, we believe that uh, there is only one race, and that is the human race. And so from that, he began this ministry, and the mission was to bring comfort to those that were being oppressed, uh, that he wanted to take people that other people had disenfranchised and let them know that they were somebody in God's sight. And so this was an affirmation of who God created people to be. And that was the real uh, vision that drove the organization, uh, the organizing of First Church of Deliverance. Our foundation is, is very, very firm. Uh, we also uh, have a strong sense of affirming people where they are, rich, poor, black, white, gay, straight, it doesn't matter. Everyone is an incarnation of the one spirit and that is of God. You know, Pastor touched a little bit on this. I think just being in this room, there's so much history, not only from the founder, yes. Reverend Cobbs, but the architecture. Oh yeah, the you architecture. You know, this was designed by, by Walter Bailey in 1929, a black architect, the first black man to graduate from UIC wow. with an architectural degree. And so to do that, this is a man operating in, at an economic time in, in this, this country, yes. you know, with stock market crashes, yes. and, mentioned the, the migration from the south to this place, mm, Bronzeville mm. neighborhood in Chicago. So when you add all of that, Reverend Cobbs, you add the architect, and now this pastor 
who is also a minister oh, yes, of music. Oh, a fine musician. Yeah. Yes, mm -hmm. I, I really, I was hoping to, to capture that, and if I didn't, at least to spark an interest so that people will go and look this up and yes. see what sort of a gem we have oh, yes. in this neighborhood. People don't think of Bronzeville as being progressive, but I mean, it's almost unheard of. When you look around, you know, and look at some of the other buildings yes. here, they're so much more traditional, but this was really... Yeah, it stands out. Oh, yeah. And those doors, my goodness. Yeah. Oh, and you know, we were talking earlier about the crucifix and how in most churches when you walk in, it's something that's stagnant. Right. It's on the wall that's facing you. Whereas this... You look up. You yes, look so up. And you, it, yeah. Exactly, mm -hmm. and you see the importance mm -hmm. of, of looking up and seeing the Savior and the resurrection yes. embodied in, in this design. It's just, yes. just really fabulous. So all of that factored into to my writing. Uh, you know, I thought of it and how I experienced this church as a child, never, ever dreaming my wildest dreams that I would be standing here in this sacred space mm -hmm. talking to someone about music. Right. I mean, that's just... It's wonderful. It is. You know, it's, th th this is one of the things in life when you look back and say, you know, now I know why I had to do everything leading up to this point. That's true. Well, there are many nights, many days that I walk into this room and no one's here but me physically. But I can sense the presence of all those that preceded me. When I walk in this room, I have a sense of obligation to those that preceded us. Reverend Cobbs and those that worked along with him, as well as all the ministers that had, that had followed him, they did such a great work. You know, someone asked me before, is it a burden for you? And I say, no. And I'll tell you why. Because this is God's church. And I don't feel that it depends on me to make it work. It has to be the Spirit of God that gets into the hearts of all the people, not just the pastors, not just the ministers, the trustees, but every member of the church. There's got to be some sense of obligation that we have because we love the Lord, because we recognize what God has done for us. And so walking in this room, it reminds me of the, the ministry and the mission that is still yet to be fulfilled. And we must serve this present age. Our calling is, is uh, to be fulfilled in this era. This place is sacred space. Um, and I love walking in here and just feeling the vibrations. Uh, and then when the music is added, I said it before, you feel the music before you hear the music. That lets you know that you've made a connection to the First Church Deliverance music ministry, is feeling it. Well, the name itself, Deliverance, and First Church of Deliverance, that means so much to me in my personal spiritual uh, journey because I always pray for deliverance, not only for myself, but for the world. And so just that whole concept of being in prayer, and I associate that, of course, with this house of prayer. And uh, I wanted to write something that captured the spirit of the church. So this is my musical portrait, First Church of Deliverance.
I've spent an enormous amount of time in public libraries over the years. The public library has always seemed to me like the epitome of public service. I mean, what's better than free knowledge? How many great minds educated themselves thanks to the help of a library? The Central Library in Milwaukee opened its doors in 1898 and has served its important mission ever since. Housed in an enormous block-long building built in a mix of French and Italian Renaissance styles common at the time, the library is home to more than 2.7 million books. So many books, so little time. Composer Brian Packham was especially taken by the famous Rotunda. I think it just stopped. <laughs> That's amazing. That's awesome. Man. The That's delay cool. in this. Was that one of the first things you were thinking about, this incredible sonic exactly. delay in here? Exactly. I was really attracted to that, and I wanted to try and incorporate that resonance into the, into the piece, whether it was from the beginning, which is kind of slow, and it's just going to grow in that reverb gradually, or the fast parts in the middle, which would, you'd really hear those echoes. Is that where you got the idea for the trombone? I mean, because, you know, uh, certainly the cello is going to resonate in here, you know, but the trombone was kind of an interesting choice. Well, the trombone, I think of, so I believe it's Arnold Schoenberg, he said trom trombone is the most noble instrument. Mm. And this is a very noble building, I mean, which yeah. houses the a library, which is one of the most noble of human endeavors. I, you know, I think that just the idea that this is a place that holds ideas and stories and it's for everyone for free forever um, forever that's a very noble aspirational quality so that's yeah. why the trombone you call the piece short stories which i yes. find really intriguing um talk about that well it's just all like the library is a collection of stories i i personally love short stories as a, a genre being that the requisites of the piece in the time constraint, uh, the, the library is in basically three editions. So I was thinking, OK, I can do three sections. If it's going to be this length, each section is going to be necessarily shorter. Um, short stories. So it's, they're all connected musically, but it's three distinct sections. Each one's pretty short. When I'm walking in, I'm crossing the street, and I'm thinking, geez, that's a, this is a, a good-looking building. A patron thought that the library was not the original occupant of this building because the patron says, there's no way they would build a beautiful building like this for the library. But yet, uh, a century ago, um, cities were building, you know, beautiful libraries. I'm fascinated by this building, so talk to me about it. Uh, I, I know some of the history, but I mean, you're an expert, so talk to me about who built it, why they built it, and, and who was meant to use it. Okay, um, back in the 1880s and early 1890s, both the Milwaukee Public Library and the Milwaukee Public Museum were looking for a larger home to house their growing respective collections. And since they were both city um, institutions, the city decided to build one large building that would house both cultural institutions. And then they had a major um, nationwide um, architectural contest. Over 70 plans were submitted, including an early one by Frank Lloyd Wright that does not look like anything that he's you know famous for, that it looks like a traditional uh, late 19th century large civic building. But the local architectural firm of Ferry and Kloss, George Ferry and Alfred Kloss, won the competition. Ferry and Kloss designed everything in the building. They didn't just simply design the exterior and the domes, but they even designed the furniture, the bookshelves, the display cases for the museums, book trucks for the library, chairs, tables, everything. Um, so basically, we got an all-in-one package from Ferry and Kloss. And the rotunda pretty much looks the way uh, it did back when it opened up in 1898. It's a, it's a beautiful building to walk into and to work in, and, uh, but our main focus is obviously public service, and I think that having a beautiful building 
uh, helps to create that feeling of trying to, you know, do our best to serve the public and to make it a, a welcoming presence, you know, for the public and our patrons. Mm -hmm. I mean, it certainly is that. This is the city of Milwaukee. Uh, these are two public institutions. They do this architectural contest. You know, they're obviously looking for something incredibly grand. I mean, this is an enormous building, right? It seems to me they were trying to make a grand statement with this building. Well, Milwaukee was growing very rapidly in the 19th century. Uh, it incorporated in 1846. Um, it had a population of 20,000 in 1850 and increased tenfold by 1890 so that there were over 200,000 people living in Milwaukee at that time. So it was basically saying we're, we're a growing large city, we want something that will help put us on the map. And of course in the early 1890s this was part of the City Beautiful movement that was happening across the country. And of course that was sparked by the Columbian Exposition in Chicago of 1893. It's basically building bow arts uh, designed buildings that um, draw a lot on the ancient Greek and Roman architectural s styles. And that was also part of the, you know, what they used to call the white city, you know, movement. So that the library museum building is very much a, a, a sister building to the Boston Public Library and the New York Public Library mm -hmm. that were constructed around the same time. So this is clearly Milwaukee thinking about itself as an emerging world-class city and it wants to get on the stage and, and this is a, a movement that's popular in architecture and we want to jump on board. That, that's correct. You know, the, the city was thinking of something that would say Milwaukee has arrived. So when I first walked into this building, uh, my mood, I was originally taken right back to my childhood. Uh, grew up in Baltimore, and my mother would take us to the library almost weekly. And I was a dinosaur kid. I loved dinosaurs. So I was thinking about these large stones kind of coming up out of the earth and being very primordial, primeval, and, and dinosaurs lumbering around. So that kind of gave me the idea that it's going to be this oozing, opening part. Um, and a library holds all our ideas so the next part was kind of the spark of human ideas and that's kind of sparking and twittering and that's where that rhythm comes from and then as that develops it becomes kind of the library holding those ideas and cradling them and nurturing those things and that leads into the final section which is that kind of noble the library is a noble aspirational thing and that's that last corral, which hints back to the beginning a little bit. Um, and rings very beautifully and in it, this space. Yeah, it does really ring in here. It's super exciting to hear the musicians really bring this space to life. 